All right, here we are. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the F World Headquarters podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, you guys. You guys are too much, really. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You guys are all too great. All right, folks. We are here today, and we are here to have a fantastic time and to get everything done we need to get done. So, just bear with me as I get things ready, as our ants are warming up to bring us to the first uh, section here. Da -da -dum. Bear with us, folks. Hold on one second, folks. Okay. We're just getting things situated here, folks. The ants are warming up, believe it or not. I don't know why they're not warmed up yet, but eh, you know, what are you going to do? That's what happens when you have uh, ants who do your, your shows for you. Just bear with me as we get them situated. Right, excellent. All right, so folks, ladies and gentlemen, the ants, and let's kick things off the way we normally do and the way we have been doing by showing our patriotism for all those involved. So, take it away, ants. Thank you. The ants are really getting better, folks, aren't they? Aren't they getting fantastic at what they're doing? I mean, they're really coming together. We'll see how well they do later. Anyway, folks, we're going to start things off with our first section, which is a special edition, as this show, as its title, and as you can see from the uh, layout and from the image, we're going to kick things off with a special duel, or I guess you could say a try, Happy birthday. So let's start with that. Ants, take it away. Happy 
Yes, folks, we're here to honor a couple of happy birthdays first and foremost. And, I, you know, I, I guess we have to go in order here as technically speaking. Uh, well, in fairness, my mother was born first, so I guess we have to go with her. Although, in order of birthdays, we'd have to go with my son, who over the weekend, he turned a whopping 20, 21 years old over the weekend. And as uh, <laughs> one half of the, di di the dynamic duo that is my wife and I, who helped raise this young man into being who he is today, uh, we couldn't be proud of her. He, he, proud of him. Uh, he had a great day uh, full of racing. He wanted to go go-karting and so forth for his birthday, and he did. Uh, he also wanted to have his first legal drink, which he did at Chili's. So thank you, Chili's, for the, his, providing him for his first drink. Uh, we're going to talk about my son a little bit later on, as he was, we had some very interesting conversations over the weekend, as you guys know. My son is one half of the, quote, Jazz and Sons Dream Matches and Icons of the F4L. He is my co-host for the YouTube Wrestling Show. And we had some very interesting conversations about some people we're thinking about adding to the roster and some people who we think are going to be leaving the roster and some different things that we're looking at and also some bizarre sports or some things that people are calling sports that we'll talk about a little later on as well. Uh, but, you know, a big happy birthday to him, first and foremost, because, I mean, let's face it, folks, everything I do in this lifetime is really for my kids and my wife and my family as a whole, uh, to leave an impact, to set the world up to be a better place. All of this is in efforts to make the world a better place for him and everybody else. So, ultimately, my kids and my family are the greatest inspiration and the greatest ambition and the greatest reasonings point everything that which I do. So that's the first and foremost thing there. So there's that. So the other happy birthday we have, uh, apparently the ants have been hanging around with my mother too much. As, um, you know, my, my mother, her birthday is actually today. Today is the 14th of November. My son's birthday is the 12th of November. I think the part that makes it sad, for me anyway, and the part that, for me, um, kind of makes it a little, uh, you know, sadder than it should be, I guess, sometimes, is the fact that, um, you know, my son and my mother really didn't get a chance to really get to know each other really well, and actually, come to think of it, he just turned 21, and I actually cringe at the idea of what would happen if... You know, my mother was still around on his and my daughter's 21st birthday. I, I said when my daughter turned 21, I could see my mother being the one to get either one of my kids in trouble. But then because she was who she was, be able to get up, get them out of the same trouble that she got them in. Um, that's just something that, you know, she was known for and something she's done. So I uh, couldn't be proud of her for that. Anyway, let's, uh, do that there. Sorry, folks, we had some technical difficulties here. We're getting uh, a few different issues here with the timing and whatnot, so I apologize for that. Um, apparently we're having some technical issues with our technical items. Anyway, I was wishing my son a happy birthday, wishing my mother a happy birthday. Uh, my son turned 21 on um, sat on Sunday, the 12th, and of course my mother would have been, well, let's see, how old would she have been today? Today is would have been her birthday, and it's also my Uncle Paul's birthday, by the way, at the same time. Um, as I've mentioned before, my mother and my uncle are twins, what they call fraternal twins, which means although they both were born at the same time, 
Uh, they're not identical, and one is a male and one is a female. This is a very common trait in some twins. Um, twins are a very interesting thing as, in general, as um, growing up in a family that has twins, um, the things you learn about them are quite interesting, as my mother would have some virtual idea what she thought twins were and what that, how that worked, and my uncle had other ideas. Um, my uncle, by the way, is still alive and well, so shout out to Uncle Paul. Happy birthday to him. Um, so my mother was born <laughs> on, uh, obviously, November 14th, 1962. So, so today she would have been celebrating her 61st birthday. Unfortunately, as we have talked about before, back in 2010, which is exactly 13 years ago, um, this past May, um, my mother was only 47 years old when she was taken from the world. Uh, she was struck and hit in a hit and run down Cape Cod in 2010 in a very tragic hit and run accident. But, uh, you know, that's not how my mother is going to go down the legacy of what she's going to go down for, no, being known for. Um, I often find that when it comes to uh, people on their birthdays, we are caught, often reminded of instances of them. And uh, I know a lot of people might be going through some loss, and people have said had to say goodbye to recently or lately or whatever. And I just want to let people know that, you know, you're not alone on that. You're not the only ones to have people who have gone. Everyone has felt the loss of whatever. Uh, it's a very common life occurrence. And it's a sad one. It's a reality and unfortunately it's something that really is inevitable. Unfortunately everyone has their time and that's one of the reasons why one of, the, one of the things my mother taught me more than anything is to live life to the fullest and to make every day as epic as the last. And that's the message that my mother would teach me, among others. <laughs> some are good and some of them not so fantastic. Uh, but I have to say, you know, one of the things that my mother just, you know, just really taught me about is uh, believing in my self-worth and also being able to use my voice when I needed to be, standing up for those who need to be stood up for, getting involved when sometimes nobody else will. In a lot of the ways, this is one of the reasons why my mother is one of the bravest people I've ever met. She could also be one of the most annoying and the most uh, um, confrontational people in the world as well. She was definitely someone who challenged authority often. Um, seemed like one of her, <laughs> one of her hobbies, actually. But um, you know, at a young age, I would remember telling, I remember hearing stories from my aunts who were all older, of my mother and how protective she was of, of my uncle and everybody else. How my mother would, you know, my mother and my uncle being twins, they would be in the same school, and often the same grade. But what they thought was a good idea was to separate the two by class. Uh, unfortunately, my mother wasn't feeling like she wanted to be away from my uncle, so many a times uh, my mother would leave whatever class she was assigned to and go visit my uncle whenever he was in class. Yes, we're talking elementary school level, folks. My mother was leaving her class to be with her brother and another. So that only the worst lasted for a little while until they decided, you know what, we might as well just keep these two together in the same class because otherwise... Lillian is going to keep coming, so is that. Um, you know, I often wish that my mother was around because, I mean, there's many things I could love to have experienced with my mother since her passing in 2010. Um, you know, my wedding being one of them. My wedding, uh, the many things I've done since then with the anti-bullying stuff, uh, become, becoming involved with um, Boston Strong, becoming involved with all the or the organizations and charities I've become part of, from Born This Way to the Jimmy Fund to Wounded Warriors to everyone else who I um, deal with on a regular basis. Um, 
you know, a lot of anti-bullying places, the Empire for Daniel Pute with Daniel Pewter. Um, we're on the same cloth when it comes to the bullying aspect, and my mother was someone who also didn't like bullies. Um, so a lot of that comes from her. And, I mean, in 2000 and, you know, years ago, uh, when I was put in that circumstance, much like my mother was multiple times over, um, you know, in the middle of Boston, I remember we were I was working for a day program, and while we were there giving out water to the runners at the Boston Marathon, we had we you know heard an explosion and whatnot, not only a block away. And um, after we made sure everyone was with us was safe, I you know took it upon myself to run towards where the blast went off to make sure see if I could help. And I think that's something my mother would would have done as well. Um, as her history and her things that she has done in her lifetime has, you know, reflected upon this. So, this is something that is a known thing about my mom. She was a natural fighter and got involved with things whenever. Sometimes it didn't even have anything to do with her, but she'd get involved anyway. So, honoring her today on her birthday, and my, my son, who is 21, he's really just starting his journey for the most part, but... We couldn't be prouder. He's a great co-host and a great mind, very creative and funny his own way. But there are other times where he's a little old man and he's very practical. He doesn't take a lot of ridiculous. He won't take a lot of ridiculous uh, chances, and he he's very comfortable, you know, going, staying in his own lane, so to speak, and uh, maybe not is so quick to jump into things he's unsure of. Which, all honesty, is a great life lesson for some. Uh, but one of the things we I really enjoy, one of the reasons why I still do all of that I do, and one of the reasons I do the, the YouTube show still and the podcast and everything else is because of him. And when I return to pro wrestling next year, he's going to be one of the reasons why. He and my daughter and my wife, really, didn't really get the chance to see me do what I do best. Next year, they will. Uh, and I'm very honored and proud of that. So... I want to do that for that, and uh, that's how that works, right? Cool. So, happy birthday to them, and uh, moving on. Guys, moving on. <laughs> well, there's something else today. Okay. So our next segment we're going to use, uh, we're going to be talking about shout-outs, of course, because shout-outs is a big part of this show. Um, I will have a regular shout-out show for you guys this week where I'll be really, the whole show will be basically highlighting amazing real-life Dream Masters and Dream Warriors. Uh, but what we're going to do here is recognize a few people in general um, by name and, of course, you know, the reasons why and so forth. And I guess the first one, you know, obviously, I, I just shouted out my son and uh, my mom, of course. But let's also shout out my wife, who yesterday, her and some other veterans, uh, as, about, as you guys may or may not know, my wife is a United States veteran of the Army. And she got, she had the courage yesterday to stand in front of an audience um, and got to speak about her time in the military and how, what that was like for her and something that she had prepared her and her other classmates. It was a an, an very humbling experience and also a very eye-opening experience to hear what it's like to be a veteran from actual veterans, people who have been to war, people who have you know gone through things that some people can only dream of. Um, my wife, for the longest time, you know, really didn't acknowledge herself as a veteran because she never technically went to war. But that does not mean that she's not a veteran. She definitely, you know, finished um, cadet training. She went through boot camp and survived that. Anyone who's ever done boot camp in the military can tell you that it is not a joke. It's not something everybody can do. My wife mastered that. And she was stationed at Fort, uh, Fort Leavenworth, I believe it was. And she um, started her, you know, training and stuff like that. She did her weekends thing. And just hearing the, 
sheer disrespect of those around her just made me absolutely despise, um, you know, disrespectful people who can't respect what someone does and follow their own path, and how quick people are to discount or dis, how quick people are to do just kind of disregard other people for following their own dream patterns. Uh, my wife went to and joined the army. She didn't have to. She did. And she was treated by people both at school and at home like she did nothing. And I want to make it publicly known that I respect my wife tremendously and my wife is one of my biggest heroes. Um, she is an incredible woman who has done an amazing job in being a co-host and a co and a, co and a tag team partner for life for raising two amazing kids. Our kids are the way they are, but thanks to my wife. Uh, my wife and I have something in common. We both come from backgrounds and families that are not necessarily the norm for most people. But one of the things we did, it, you know, decide early on is that we would never let our kids grow up the way we did, and we give the opposite. I grew up in I grew up in a very turmoil and you know turbulent lifestyle, so to speak. And my wife had such a had also a interesting backstory. We wanted to make sure our kids would never have that, so we um, you know made sure they had all the things that they needed, especially love. That's the biggest thing we gave them. There was not a day that goes by, and there's still not a day that goes by that we don't tell both of our kids that we love them and each other. Um, my wife and I last month celebrated official five years of marriage, but you know, two kids later, we were destined by soul and by heart. And eventually, you know, it took us until 2014 to realize that the person we were supposed to be with in front of us the whole time was in front of each other, was each other. So. Yeah, one of those romantic happy ending stories. Um, is life easy all the time? No, but you know what? Nothing in life is. But you know what is real? The love we have for each other, the love we have for our kids, the passion we have to inspire both of the, our kids to make sure that any hardships that we had to encounter or we have to encounter, we make less impactful for them. So that's how that works. And they're ultimately the reason why I do everything that I do. So, that being said, um, for my, you know, we're going to do a little something special at the end of these, um, at the end of the, at the end of the, um, my shout out portion, we're going to have a little special tribute to my wife and to all of those people yesterday. Granted, not all of them are army, but I wanted to share, play something for you guys in honor of. My, my wife and all the veterans who self selflessly put themselves at risk to perfect the, to protect the freedoms and the liberty of people they don't even know and then the fact that those people who don't even know who they are have no idea what they have actually sacrificed for their sex for their safety for the freedom that they have to treat them the way that they do so there's that. We'll celebrate that at the end. Let's get back into the shout-outs, though. So I had mentioned earlier that my son and I were talking. We were during his, you know, his birthday celebration. We were waiting for his race to begin, as he was going to do some go kart racing. And we see on the television they're playing something called pickleball on the television. I don't know if you guys have ever seen pickleball. But I'm going to give you basic description of pickleball. And tell me if it reminds you of any other sport. <clears throat> People, men, women, whatever, either persons or teams, uh, stand across from nets that are set in the middle. They are given balls and a racket that looks like an oversized uh, ping pong paddle. And you basically hit the ball over the net to get points. Does this game sound familiar? Uh, if you think it sounds like tennis, well, that's kind of what it sounds like. It, my son and I looked at these people who treated... This was, mind you, on a sports channel, and this is being treated as a sport, and it's covered as a sport, pickleball. And this is basically a cross between tennis and table tennis, which is a game that kids play. Tennis... 
itself is a very demanding and hard sport to play and master. It's not easy. I played in high school for a little while as part of gym class. I do enjoy playing tennis when I have time and just for fun. My son, who is naturally competitive, is not overly fond as, uh, as, in, uh, as tennis because of the amount of running and whatnot that has to take place. But he is competitive and he will play. But one of the things we do like, do think is that we we think it's ridiculous that pickleball is even a relevant thing to be considered to be a sport. Um, my son turned to me at one point and said, "You know, these are athletes. So basically, they're playing a giant game of ping pong using a ping po- an oversized ping pong paddle." Uh, and that's the only way to describe the paddle you use is an oversized ping pong paddle. But yet they're crossing it with tennis. This is like something that sounds like something should be, you know, featured in like the Naked Gun series or some parody of what sports are. And that's basically it. It's a parody of tennis. The people who play this now, mind you, this is where the funniest parts come at all. These people who are playing pickleball, you know, have outfits that you would think they're definitely... Uh, tennis players, they got the polo shirts and the skirts and the visors and man, do they take this game of giant te- table tennis serious. But my son and I, you know, sometimes my son is, you know, way more smarter than the average 21 year old in the sense that he has a different outlook on things. And one of the things that my wife and I uh, to you know, allow our kids and encourage our kids to use is use their own descriptions, and we don't put limits on uh, what our kids, how our kids should view other things. And you know, tennis is something that, even though my son knows how hard tennis is, he respects people who actually play tennis. Um, and as you guys know, in the, you know, as we have icons of the F4L and Dream Masters. We have talked about some a couple people before in the past, um, Artem and Tim, uh, the tennis brothers, who are tennis players out over from um, the UK and the Russian area, and they played in Dubai and they played all over the place, and they are tremendous tennis players, and they are legitimately athletes. And I thought it was hysterical when my son said, "You know what we should do." We should have the Tennis Brothers on the show next year and then have two people who think that they're like tennis players and they'll have them pickleball players and just see how quick the real tennis players burn these people out. Because, listen, if you want to play table tennis, it's fine. It's a table tennis game. But don't call table tennis or a.k.a. ping pong do not call ping pong a sport. <laughs> and yes, I know that Forrest Gump made ping pong famous, but that was because Forrest Gump didn't play tennis. Uh, thankfully, otherwise he'd have to, I don't know who he would have to encounter in that in that big there. It's easier for Forrest Gump to play table tennis than it is foreseeable to see him playing tennis, which takes a lot more endurance, a lot more IQ, and a lot more... Um, you know, you have to have really good um, hand and eye coordination, endurance. You have to have good skill. You have to be able to run on a dime. And all honesty, Forrest Gump, he might be able to run long distances, and he might be able to bat a you know slap at ball from one end of the table to the other. But he's not going to be playing no tennis. Um, and if you you know the movie, the sports that Forrest Gump did, they're all sports that are basically anybody can do. He didn't play soccer either, by the way. Soccer, a.k.a. football to the world audience. Soccer to the American audience. And that's because, again, Forrest Gump was not going to run up and down a field like a soccer player because football is a lot... American football is a little bit easier on someone than it is in soccer. See, and I'll tell you why that's. I can say this. One, I've played American football, and I've also played soccer, a.k.a. football, to the world audience. And one of the biggest differences and one of the reasons why soccer is going to take a more serious athlete is because of the amount of running that is involved and endurance that is involved within the sport and the amount of teamwork. 
See, let me explain to you guys how American football works. For those people who don't know, and to the ones who play American football, I am not downplaying, you know, that your sport isn't hard. I'm sure it is. And it, but you can't compare, you know, the level of endurance. You see, American football is stop and go. Um, you have two squads of people a defense team and an offense team, and they sh- they don't share the, t- the, s- the field at the same time. You take turns, and also it's not like you're nonstop running the, quote, football. You have to wait for one guy to pass it to another guy who's going to throw it to another guy, and then you got to watch the other guy run to the end goal. American football closely resembles, in my opinion, to r- what rugby is. Rugby would be similar, where you throw it to a guy and another guy gets it and you have to kick it in the net. The only difference is, the only person who kicks the ball is the, quote, kicker. And usually that's to kick the ball off to the other team to see where they have to start off. Or, when the, other, when the person runs the score in, literally runs across and scores the thing, then you have what's called a kicker come out and get the extra point. There is no feet involved in the sport of football, per se. It's just pass and catch. Um, and you have two squads, a defense squad and an offense squad. Anyone who's ever played soccer, a.k.a. football, you know that you're one team. You're on that field. Everyone's at once. You don't change no lines. There's no line changes in soccer. Um you know, you have defense and offense on the team at the same time, and you were if no clearly there are what they call replacement players, and they have reserves who are people who come in when someone gets tired, ty- you know, gets tired or gets sick or not feeling well or needs a break. That should be good for any sport. I think that's okay to have a replacement person come in there. But what what American football does is they can change the entire line of people. So the offense comes on, then the defense comes on, and then they switch off. And, you know, yeah, you can say, well, American football, they hit each other. They they, they tackle each other. Well, that's fine and dandy. Look at the amount of padding that the football players wear. Helmets and pads and guards and everything is padded somewhere. And in soccer, there is no pads. There's no helmets. There's no chest protectors. There's no... You know, shoulder pads. There's no, you know, pads for your butt. <laughs> no, pu- no pun intended. I'm sorry for the, you know, reference, but there is none of these extra pads. You're, you're lucky to get shin guards. Shin guards you need because you get kicked in the shins quite a bit. And also, anyone who's ever gotten gotten hit with a soccer ball, kicked by a soccer player or a football player, uh, you know how hard that hurts, <laughs> and it does. And people use their heads, and you're not allowed to use your hands. Football, American football, you use your hands for the most part. Again, no one kicks the ball except for the kicker, and there's only one of those. So that's where the differences are. And again, if American football is your thing and, you know, whatever else, that's okay. We respect football players because everyone's, you know, doing their own thing. But you can't downplay one sport for another. Now, in this case here, we're talking about tennis versus Pickleball? But first of all, why is this name? Pickleball? Why don't you just call it Giant t- giant Ping Pong? Because that's what it is. You have two people standing across from a giant tennis net, which would resemble a uh, ping pong net. And then you play ping pong, basically, with the ping pong paddle you use instead of a tennis racket. I mean, you play it otherwise the same way. You hit the ball over the thing, you get the points... But these people who were playing pickleball, they really thought that they were real athletes, that they're real tennis players. I mean, Andre, Andre Agassi and the, uh, the Andre Agassis of the world and the Mira Chernikovas and the, you know, the many other uh, tennis players, or Arnhem's and the ten- Tims of the world could show you what real tennis is. And I don't think these pickleball people would handle real tennis, in all honesty. So, I mean, but it's interesting that my son and I have that same opinion, and my son knew who Artem and Tim Tim were from uh, various things on thing. We've been talking about 
uh, new stars to add to icons of the F4L. And he said, what about those tennis brothers? They're brothers, first of all, but also because they're tennis players, they could also double as, they could either do singles or they can do doubles, and they're just as effective. And also, being tennis players, they could show people what tennis really is and how hard it really is. Um, so, so, Tim and Artem are tremendous athletes, young rising stars in the tennis world, and I think that they will be right up there with the Andre Agassiz of the world, and the Ryosha Nikovas, and the numerous other people out there and what's what's separate again one of the things that is so incredible with these two young brothers is how they understand what showmanship is and they also understand the, the they like to stand out these pickleball people are all dressed the same as any other generic wannabe tennis player Artem and Tim are actual tennis players who dress like they should be on a runway model they should be runway models with the brightest of colors and the flashiest of outfits. And, you know, there are really fashion plates as far as the tennis world goes. Uh, both my son and I both agree on that. And that's why, you know, we have reached out to Tim and Arnim and asked them about what they think about that. So I will have hopefully an update for you guys, hopefully soon, um, to see if maybe the brothers from t for, who are tennis players can come and show everyone else what tennis is. Um, again, I don't think you can replace the real thing with, you know, a, a watered-down version of something. And you can't call the people who are playing giant ping-pong athletes either. Um, because real tennis players would eat them alive. So that's, that's my thoughts on pickleball. But also a shout-out to Artem and Tim, the tennis brothers, who are... Right, even right now, they're getting ready to do their next tournament. And if you knew what the conditioning was and the work ethic these people have, you guys would have a different sense of what tennis is. Um, my son and I plan on visiting the Tennis Hall of Fame, which, by the way, is not far from us. Um, and when we do, we hope to you know bring some more news from you know tennis and stuff. As I said, I, I play tennis once in a while for fun. Uh, I don't, I'm not anywhere near the level that these two brothers are. And I'll tell you this, too. I would give them the respect because I know that they should be able to beat me no problem playing tennis. And I'm not ashamed to say that they would beat me in tennis because this is what they do. They are the masters in their class. I, I play for fun. There's a difference, see? Now, when you're playing this pickleball, that's for fun. That's for games and whatever else. But tennis is a real sport with real athletes who have real um, skills and everything else. So let's not confuse the two uh, for the people who actually play sake, anyway. So there you go. Also, we want to acknowledge our we got to acknowledge our friend Ryder Lockwood, the current Dream Masters BA MMA Grand Prix champion who has had numerous matches on our show now. He has become, as you guys may or may not know, he is our BA MMA Grand Prix champion after defeating the other new champion, Action Jackson Baker. Um, after the rematch, Ryder retained his championship. We have had a match since then to find the number one contender. We now know who that will be. And I'm going to tell you, that's going to be a matchup to be talked about for years to come on our show. And remember, we have no control over the outcomes of any of those. Uh, and, and for those people who are wondering, we're talking about icons of the F4L and Ryder Lockwood being the BA MMA Grand Prix champion. As I was mentioning about Artem and uh, Tim, the tennis brothers, they would be on our Telenet Universal division and there would be just a, there would be another brother team that would be added to that spectrum of that side of things. So our Telenet Universal side the Tennis Brothers. Ryder Lockwood is holding down the fort as far as the VA MMA division. Um, he had he had done really well in his tournament. Uh, we had our Team Warfare event, as you guys remember, maybe the adult, but we had our Team Warfare event uh, not long ago. Actually, this month. Last month. No, this month. I was right. And congratulations to the winner of this year's Open M our Open Team Warfare event which I don't know if anybody was really surprised 
because I don't know if anyone's ready to stop the juggernaut that is the Adele boys. Um, definitely there was some interesting upsets in the Team Warfare tournament we had this year. Um, some people say that it was surprising to see that Hollywood Fitness got knocked over, but got you know bumped out of the event by the, Paul, the prime time Pauls. But hey, we don't have any control over that either. Uh, the F4L did very well, but in the end, unfortunately, all kinds of things happened. First of all, one of our teammates got injured, and we had to get two replacements. <laughs> because one couldn't wrestle without the other, so we had to get two replacements. And again, I wanted a um, quick add-on shout-out to Ryder Woods for stepping in. Uh, Ryder Woods, who is a um, Ryder Woods, who is a uh, YouTuber, young man YouTuber, wrestling fan. Uh, he might be one of my favorite people to watch now, even though, um, you know, he is the epitome of what a wrestling fan is. And as someone who's been in the wrestling business for a long time, it's really nice and refreshing to see someone who is uh, so passionate about being a wrestling fan. Because remember, folks, even though I am, you know, I entered the world of being a professional wrestler, and next year I return to doing what I do best. But it's because we all started as that kid growing up, cheering for those heroes who inspire us. And um, I hope that Ryder Woods continues to do everything he does to become um, you know everything he's going to be become I hope that he follows his journey and I hope him all the best uh, I am trying to get him on the show actually to see if we can get him to talk wrestling on this podcast uh, but we'll see about that but you know just wanted to recognize him in the middle of talking about another writer Ryder Lockwood has done a great job in the BA MMA division and he'll be defending his BA MMA Grand Prix Championship, I believe, on Friday. Uh, so make sure you guys are tuning in for that epic and match. And if you guys know who the number one contender is, if you don't, you should watch our show from this past weekend because we do know who the number one contender is. Um, as it was an incredible matchup, we had five of the six of the best in the division compete for the one opportunity to challenge Ryder and it was interesting because Ryder himself in his second match ever found himself in that circumstance um, there were other people involved in there as well and I think it's interesting that the person who won is someone who has done that before and it's going to be interesting to see these two clash if you would in an MMA style thing uh, my son and I currently are debating about if it should be an Iron Man or not you know, maybe I'll ask the champion if he wants to defend it in an Iron Man match. So Ryder Lockwood, I'm going to reach out to and see if he wants to do if we, if he wants it to be an Iron Man match. For those people who don't know what an Iron Man match is, it is a match in which you whoever gets the most pinfalls or submissions within a lot of time would become the champion. <laughs> and I say that. And as of late, we've had some people this year alone have put on clinics in, in these matches. Um, one that comes to mind is the Iron, Man, the Iron Men tag team match we had between the Adele boys and the, the Menya boys. Um, Mason the Hammer and Ty the Devil Adele defending against um, Henry El Nero and Jairo the Pitbull Menya of the Menya boys. That one there went to a, a double sudden death Iron Man match because we gave them their allotted time of 40 minutes or 45 minutes and they had a draw. So we had to do it again for another 45 minutes and a draw again until we had to have a third and final. And then that's how we finally had a winner clear. It was something. That was this year. <laughs> Uh, Ryder Lockwood and some other people have been tremendous in their since being added to our roster, and um, you know he's a very he's a very charismatic individual in general. And I guess he had a tournament over the weekend. Apparently, uh, sounds like he, you know <laughs> sounds to me that uh, you know there's some people who just don't like others to succeed. And there's some people who like to hold others down. Maybe they get a little offended because someone is better than them or whatever. 
but Ryder Lockwood didn't let that, you know, doesn't let that bother him that one tournament because he knows he's a beast. He's on our show. He's our champion for a reason. We don't pick those champions. They do it themselves. And the fact that he has won over the people he has already is a, is a statement to his testament to how tough he really is. Coming up this Friday, he'll be defending his title. And whether or not it will be an Iron Man match, that is yet to be seen. What I can tell you is that you got to remember, win or lose, the, the former champion is always the first one to get a rematch. And if it's going to be a rematch, it will definitely be an Iron Man match the second time around. So there will be no more discrepancies to who the champion is. Sometimes that's what you have to do. That's the reason for the Iron Man match. It's a clear-cut winner. Speaking of clear-cut winners and taking a person of real-life Dream Masters and taking (laughs) the fact of Dream Matches in general, what if... In real life, you were to get a dream match in the MMA world, youth MMA world. Well, guess what? We're going to get that. And it's going to be tough for me. As <laughs> What's interesting here is two people who I have, you know, we have sang the praises of. Uh, we've sang praises of since way back when, before a lot of other people apparently did. Isaiah, the natural trainer, the very best of the U.S., is, a, is actually in real life going to compete against the very best of the UK and of Europe, that being Noah, the Nightmare Tyndall. These two juggernauts in their own right, these two warriors, these two beasts, the best of their division, the best of their country, are absolutely about to go to war one-on-one, real life, not on our show. And i got to say, I'm excited, but I'm also nervous because I respect the heck out of both of the young men. They're both monsters in their own right. The Noah the Nightmare Tyndall has been a guest on the show. The Isaiah the Natural will try to get on the show, and eventually he will be. The Noah the Nightmare Tyndall will eventually will come back here as well. I'm wondering if I can maybe get them both to come back at the same time. That would be interesting, huh? I'll be the neutral party. But anyway... These two juggernauts in real life are about to go one-on-one. And what's interesting is that they are on that list, the same list as Ryder Lockwood is on, the same list that the Adele boys, the Menya boys, the Jackson Bakers, the Big E, Elijah Furtons, the um, Dimitri Chernikos are on. They are future UFC-bound champions. And the fact that Isaiah the Natural represented the United States, Noah the Nightmare Tyndall represented the UK, what an amazing fight this is going to be. Um, people have, you know, recently there were people over in the UK who were debating about who the best is. I don't know why. They should have just listened to me way back when because I don't spread false things. There are a few big names in the UK world, and there are some very talented people over there. But when it comes to... You know, once it'll, when you finally have someone who shows you what the reality of it is, when you have someone who says, okay, not only am I the best, I'm going to show up and prove it, and then they do, that, guess what? That mini beast thing, that goes away. There's no more mini beast because he got tamed by the nightmare. That's the plain and simple truth. Whether people want to get over it themselves or not, you can give the other person all the praise you want, but the fact is, no other nightmare Tyndall ate that kid alive. Exactly like I knew he would. Why? Because Noah the Nightmare Tyndall is a different beast of the UK. He is a different animal when it comes to someone you're competing against because he's a thinking man's fighter and he fights with heart. Now, the other guy, I don't know what his deal is. I don't know. I'm talking about that fight that Noah not won the, another championship at where he proved that sometimes the nightmare is better than the beast. In fact, he proved very much so that he is better than the beast. Um, and the next time, you know, I, I can't believe how many people on social media, all over YouTube, and all these other people wanted to hype up this other kid. When I have been saying all along, out of the UK anyway, that Noah the Nightmare Tyndall is going to be a future. He is the beast, he is the monster, he lives up to that name. Watch our show, watch Icons of the FRL. Noah the Nightmare Tyndall came returned to action this year. 
And this year, he has been the BA MMA Grand Prix champion more times than anybody else. And when he's had it, he's held it a long period of time. He didn't get it by sitting around doing nothing. He didn't take it. He didn't keep that title by defending it against nobodies and people who weren't at his level. He competed it and he defended the title against everybody who came up in front of him. Some of the best competitors we've had this year. Noah the Nightmare T- T- Tyndall also competed this year at our Open MMA Tournament. He came into the final round, folks. He's a legitimate animal of the UK. He is the UK. Then you have the United States. You have Isaiah the Nightmare Trenya, a very humble young man, a young man who knows what he is worth. He knows that he's a beast. He puts his work in. He puts his ethic in. He has his ability. He has his knowledge. He has his belief. And he believes in himself. He believes in the art. He believes in, and he surrounds himself and continues to grow and learn from icons and legends. Isaiah the Natural Trinia is America's Noah the Nightmare Tyndall. He is hardworking. He is dedicated. He has a heart. He is a what Americans are made of. He is the heart of American spirit, the work ethic, the drive, the constant effort to become better, become bigger, become faster, stronger, more efficient. He adds tricks to his arsenal. He adds things. He's not afraid to ask for help. He's not humble enough. He humbles himself enough to learn from others and not be afraid to ask for advice. He learns from people like Chuck Liddell. Isaiah the Natural Trenna is America's America's representative at these world games. He went to Germany and destroyed it over there. He went to the Pan Games and won it over there. There's a reason for this. Isaiah the Natural is representative of the United States because he is America. Now, me personally, I have to stay neutral. I have to stay in the middle between both. As I know them both, I respect them both, and they are both fantastic athletes. And I'll tell you... There are some matches, there are some real-life dream matches that are out there in the world. This, to me, is one of them. The last fight, the only reason I wanted to see that last one that Noah did is because I knew exactly how it would end up. Because someone needed to humble the other person. Someone needed to show people what the real story is. They needed to show them who the real man of the UK is. And Noah the Nightmare Tyndall showed up and delivered. So stop with the fake uh, acknowledgments of everybody else out there. Because Noah proved once and for all, he is the beast slayer. He is the nightmare. He is number one of the UK and of Europe. Isaiah the Natural Trina has proven time and time again, he is the best of the best of the USA. This is going to be a good fight, this one coming up. And unlike the last one, this one's not lopsided. This one is hard for me to pick a winner because both of these young men are absolutely tremendous in their own right. They have got the skill level. They have the acknowledgement. They have the support of everyone around them. And honestly, I'm honored and and humbled at the fact that both of them are as amazing as they are and people who are entertained coming here to the icon at the podcast and they do know how much we respect and love them Noah the Nightmare Tyndall last year was do- was noted as being an F4L a brother of the F4L and he is I think Isaiah the Natural Trina is going to be joining that roster this year I mean joining that family this year we're going to be acknowledging him and some other people this year as actual brothers and welcome them into the F4L brotherhood as Isaiah the Natural Trinia is exactly what you want in an, in an F4L. He is the epitome of what those things are. Love, care, and compassion, understanding, respect for each other's differences. He has a work ethic. He fights for the, those things he believes in. Don't get those things twisted. You can still have all of those virtuals and all of those... You can have all of those values and all of those virtual things, the love, care, compassion, understanding, respect for each other's differences, but you can still be a beast slayer, a monster, and be passionate about the things that you believe in. So hopefully the Isaiah the Natural gets to hear, and the Noah the Nightmare Tyndall gets to hear, that on this show we acknowledge both of them as being the best of their divisions in both of their countries. Because we have said it time and time again. Maybe the rest of the world's hiding under a rock somewhere. Clearly that's going to be what it is. 
don't expect it. Don't don't follow the false idols. These are the real deals. This is the future of the UFC. And when I gave you guys a list of the people who are going to be future UFC champions, I want to point out that since I given that list, every single person on that list since that list came out has done big things and has won big tournaments over and over again since that list came out weeks and weeks and months ago. Action Jackson Baker. He had a little bit of an issue down in Florida, but that weekend, the weekend he was on this podcast, two days two, two days later, he won his thing where he came from. Biggie Elijah Furton of the San Diego, San Francisco area. He is going to be a beast when he gets back into the thing. He is a multiple sport athlete. Big E, the king of bling, as we call him, he is the epitome of what that is, and I also see him becoming not only a MMA fighter, but he could become the new WWE and UFC champion. That's my thoughts on Big E Elijah Furton. Ryder Lockwood, he is an amazing athlete. He's up there on that list. The Adele boys, individually, the, the Menya boys, there's two of them, both of them are on that list. And the countless other people, the uh, untamed Jess, Jesse the Untamed, another amazing athlete. We're going to try to get him here too. But Jesse the Untamed is another tremendous athlete who has a very, very um, wide range, and he gets the showman part of it. And he also puts a lot of work in becoming the best of the best. Connor Stellerman is another person who I believe trains with Untamed Jesse, Jesse Untamed. He is another tremendous athlete. I've talked about him on this show. Um, there's Jack White. There's so many amazing athletes of the world, and yet other people are often idolized and looked at like they are the next thing. Listen, just listen to me from now on when I tell you someone's going to be a big deal because I'm not going to candy coat. I'm going to tell you who the real deal is. And I'm going to tell you who the who the ones are who you should be keeping an eye on. If you'll notice, I never once said the other person's name other than who Noah was fighting because I don't believe anything that comes out of that camp. I don't know if it's him or his trainer, the people. I don't know what the issue is. Here's what I do know. I get feelings and I see things. What I see, I don't like. That's the reality of it. When you fight people who are not at your level and you call that a win and you call yourself a beast over people who are not at your level, who aren't as experienced as you are, you're not a beast. You're just someone who calls yourself that. No other nightmare. Tyndall and all these other people earn everything that they have. And that is the difference between the two. So there. Some people need to be need to tell themselves who they are, and other people tell them who they are. I am one of those people that they invented my name, and I get that. So that's where we are. So Isaiah the Natural Trinia, Noah the Nightmare Tyndall, are in real life going to be duking it out. And you know what I'm also thinking? I think Isaiah the Natural Trinity needs to become a part of the icons of the roster as well. I think of next year's Open MMA Tournament, and I think of all the amazing athletes we've seen compete before, and I'm looking forward to this year, who it's going to be a growing roster. Last year we had the, you know, the usual suspects, if you would, even the newer stars. Uh, Big E Elijah Furton really jumped in around that time, but he has fallen right into the equation. Um, Grace and the Super Duck Russell. The Benya boys, the Adele boys, um, you know, the Nightmare Noah Tyndall. This year, we're going to have even more people. This year, um, we're going to have the right headed Terry Anthony Demweeks, who trains with the Nightmare Noah Tyndall. We're going to have um, the Jackson Bakers of the world, who weren't there last year. We're going to have the Ryder Lockwoods, who were not there last year. The Dmitry Chernikov, who wasn't there last year. Imagine having someone like Isaiah the Natural Trena as part of that tournament. Or some of these other amazing athletes to compete. We already have a stacked roster, and it can only get bigger and better from all over the world. 
if you if you are an icon, you are a dream master. We acknowledge it. We matter what it is you do. And then we just figure out who goes to the universal side of things and who goes to the BAMMA side of things. That's how that works. So that's that's kind of where that is. And with that, I talked about my mother, Sean, and my wife. I talked about the tennis brothers, Artem and Tim, and the fact that they are real tennis players and they are legitimate athletes. And we invited them to be part of the icons already for next year. I talked about Isaiah the Natural Trenna and Noah the Nightmare Tyndall, who are in real life going to have a, a battle of the century, best of the U.S. versus the best of the U.K., what kind of a great thing that is. Move over Rocky and Apollo Creed, or move over um, Drago versus Rocky Balboa. This is going to be a fight. And then, of course, Ryder Lockwood, current champion, BAM Mega Ramp champion, and everyone else I've thrown in between that because they all deserve to be acknowledged. Um, uh, hope I also got a little update. Um, Wesley Holloway, who's a young man from Terrifier 2, apparently he had a audition as Hollywood has gone back to work, folks. There's no more strike. Go figure. Uh, but I am going to do exactly what I said I was going to do on a future show where I'm going to put together a mock film with a mock cast. And I'm going to show exactly people what the cost is of SAG and um, why this is such an interesting thing. And also why this strike might have killed the independent filmmaker. Yes, you heard that right. <laughs> I don't think... Knowing what I know of the independent filmmaker, knowing the rules of SAG, knowing what is involved, knowing the price tags associated with such things, I'm going to do a full show on this, and I hope people are listen to it with an open mind. And I'm not trying to, you know, really come down on SAG or anything like that, but I want people to acknowledge what's going to happen and why it's so impactful, and why. All this time, everyone's talking about these big studios, these big Hollywood producers, these big, huge names in film, but you forgot about the independent filmmakers, the people who don't have the budgets of the of the Spielbergs and the Lucases. You forgot about those guys, and you have might have SAG might have killed every single up and coming newing director and filmmaker because there's not a lot of people who are going to be able to get the kind of uh, you can't afford uh, we'll go into that on a future show what is going to actually transpire because that's a different uh, section, that's a different conversation for a different time but it's nice to see our friends who are in Hollywood back to work doing the things that they were meant to do you know, enjoying working in the entertainment world Wesley Hollow is a very amazing, talented young man. I look forward to seeing his movie. I know that Michael Levy was a big part of making that film, or Daniel Harris, a movie called Stream. I can't wait to look at that and watch that. That's going to be a great film, I'm sure. Uh, same minds on the Terrifier 2. Terrifier 3 is going to be coming out. I'm excited for that as well. And, of course, you know, you guys know how much I respect da Damian Leone. Anyone who's in the filmmaking world should be respecting the fact that Damian Leone kicked down that door and opened that avenue to so many other people. But however, I say that, but now with this whole thing here, I don't know how that's going to play into things going forward. You would have to raise quite a bit more to get the levels you're going to need to fund something like that now. But what Damian Leone did and his team and Michael Levy, all these people collectively doing for Terrifier 2, what they have done has opened the door and the avenue to so many other filmmakers out there. Unfortunately, SAG might have just slammed that door right back in the face of all those same people. Um, but we'll go over that in another show in a different time. So there's that. So there's that. Uh, I said I was going to play something in honor of my wife. And you know what? This is honestly going to go for everybody. And unfortunately, I'm sorry uh, to Noah the Nightmare Tyndall and Artem and Tim, who may not be associated with this song per se. Um, but this is honor of my wife, who is a veteran of the United States Army. Uh, Isaiah the Natural and um, 
everyone else who I mentioned who are in the United States would probably get some feeling for this. But this is in tribute to my wife, all the brave men and women around the world who sacrificed for so many other things. And for other people, this is just a way to commemorate real-life dream warriors and people who fight for uh, the right things in life. Okay? So this is for you guys. This is for my wife. Ants, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. The ants are doing phenomenal, aren't they? They're tremendously getting better in their voicing and their singing, the ants are. Good job, guys. You guys did great. Um, all right. So now let's go to our next segment. And I don't know why they're not wanting to play their usual cutaway, but I guess they don't. So uh, we'll go with this one. All right. So this is another hot topic we're going to chat about real quick. And this is something I'm also very passionate about, and that, of course, being bullying. As you guys know, I do not like bullies. Um, I do not like... <laughs> I do not like bullying here or there. I do not like bullying anywhere. Yep, I just mocked a Dr. Seuss reference because anyone who participates in bullying and the art of bullying are juvenile and they are in fact you know not people who probably are understanding of this podcast in all honesty but um, listen so I, I had got you know you guys I do a lot of work for the for many of the bullying conversations and many of the bullying organizations and the countless schools that I go to to talk about why bullying is never okay the effects it does long term, um, warning signs that someone's being bullied, things to pre- to do to prevent getting bullied, things to do when you see someone getting bullied, and I always find it. I always feel like I got punched in the gut whenever I see someone getting bullied somewhere, and for me, I'm annoyed in two reasons. I'm annoyed one. Because someone thought that the idea, the smart idea to help someone or someone thought rather than seeing something that is done wrong, seeing someone being bullied, outnumbered, outmatched, being ganged up on, someone seeing such a thing feels that that warrants pulling out a phone rather than call someone who will do something since you obviously don't have the guts to do so rather than do something yourself you feel it's necessary to pick that phone up and record that act on the phone because that does what? it builds you views because <coughs> people like me see it and here's my thoughts it's like anyone else who ever watched any documentary ever you watch these nature documentaries <coughs> and you see that you know these cute little baby turtles just got hatched and the cute little baby turtles start walking down to the beach right clearly it's being recorded and filmed by a photographer the cameraman is watching these turtles the cameraman is shooting these turtles walking these baby little baby turtles walking to the ocean for the first time which they need to do to survive 
But then what you see is the giant seagull or the albatross or some one of their many nemesises coming and picking up those turtles and eating them. And you watch that and you're like, oh, why didn't the cameraman do something? Put the camera down and help the poor little baby turtle. And you can say, well, that's nature's course. Nature's supposed to be that way. We are human beings. We are human beings. We're not turtles. We're not dogs and cats and these other animals. We, as humans, put ourselves in this category like we're better than every single animal in the kingdom. Dare call ourselves the kings of the animal kingdom. Yet we, as people, have absolutely no moral compass. And we, as people, as a society, people in general, think that the idea of pulling out a phone and recording someone being bullied is better than actually putting the phone down and or calling someone who is going to do something using a sense of stability and mindset if you can't do something about it then get someone who will but recording it then posting it like you're some hero like you're Steven Spielberg or the next big thing let me tell you I see your videos and I think you're petty as heck I see your video. The news media will get these videos, and all the things you're going to see are shocking. What's more shocking, the fact that people thought it was a good idea to pull out the phone and record the incident, or the fact that no one thought to get involved, not only stop the recording, but stop the fight to begin with, stop the bullying altogether? I'm not going to mention names right now because. Um, I did ask the person if I could talk about them particularly, but because of the fact that just last week, this is a true story, last week on the day that I had to do a, I went to a book, as you guys know, last week I had a very busy day. I got my hair cut, I had to do an anti-bullying speech at my old high school, at my old school, and then I had to, went to my friend's book, uh, book launch, which was a very big honor, I'll talk about that after, but what baffles me is the fact that how many times I go to these schools and I talk about bullying and why it's not okay and the fact that I put all this work into preventing things like, you know, when you see something going on, rather than pick up the phone and the first thing you think about doing is recording the thing versus stepping in and doing something about it, that's, when you ha- that's where I come into play and I teach these kids what to do in those circumstances because sometimes they don't know and then once they once the incident happens there's nothing I can do over the weekend I, I had seen some footage of something that happened recently to someone who I have a lot of respect for someone who I view to be someone with a lot deal of respect he is a hard working honorable young man and I saw him getting bullied someone thought it was a good idea to record it and then no one does nothing what I was happy about is he labeled the people responsible exactly what they were, cowards. And in my opinion, anyone who records such a thing, rather than take action and do something about it, then you're cowards too. And maybe even more so, because you could have stepped in to make it better. You could have stepped in to make a difference. So it wasn't as bad. So it wasn't going to go far. But rather than do that, you thought it was a better idea to record and upload and laugh and stand around and act like baboons. I got news for you. If a baboon sees another baboon getting attacked, the other baboons jump into action and they help that baboon. If a, sh- if a, wh- if a whale is being attacked by a shark, then in a, and it's a pod, what ends up happening is the rest of the pod of whales don't swim away and watch. They go into action and they start attacking the shark to protect the rest of the herd. These are animals that we think we're better than because we call ourselves humans. A baboon. A baboon is wiser than a human being. What does that say? If a dog sees another dog being attacked by other dogs. Dogs generally will put themselves 
in the way of their humans all the time. In fact, that's probably the best example. If a dog sees another person being a person, a human, being treated unfairly or being attacked, a dog has the sense to jump in and help the human. Dolphins. Dolphins will sometimes see something going down and they'll jump in to help a human. But yet we as human beings, we as human beings, don't feel the need to help someone else when they see something going wrong. What is wrong with people? And before someone sees, well, the United States, it's all that. Guess what? This is a global thing. Bullying happens all over the world. Because the incident I'm talking about happened in the UK. Bullying is everywhere. And also, bullying is not just at school. Bullying can happen anywhere. I don't know who ever put a thing that said bullying only happens at school. Probably the person who also said that bullying only happens when, you know, the teacher's right in front of them. The same person asked, well, where was your teacher during this time? Or sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you. Those kinds of people, they're the wrong with the society because they're teaching kids. They're the ones encouraging this, and they're the ones who aren't allowing any kind of conversation or any kind of growth within the problem of the pandemic, the real enemy, which is bullying. I don't understand why bullies do what they do. Um, I have spent many years trying to learn. I have a human degree. I have a human services degree in both human services. My human service degree covers both psychology, sociology, a little bit of both. I have a degree. My degree basically allows me to become a social worker if I wish to. I did countless research on bullying. I've done numerous bullying conversations and lectures and so forth. I make this a regular thing. And guess what? In those schools, I'm very happy to say, the bullying thing has gone down a little bit. But when I'm not there, the idea is giving the other students the knowledge, the tools on what to do when that happens. Because guess what? Adults are ignorant to the fact that kids know more than we do. As I demonstrate and I talk about in my little thing. Adults only know what kids tell us. In all honesty, not, more often than not, kids who are getting bullied will not tell their parents they're getting bullied. It could be a pride thing. It could be a, an embarrassment thing. It could be a fear thing. And what most people teach kids is, oh, if you're getting bullied, tell someone you trust. Well, that is good to do. It's always good to have someone to bat things off of. But what you need is a strong foundation. What you need is someone who can step up and end the act altogether. What you need is to take away the power the bullies have, which is that feed over having power over someone else. Because that's what the bullies want. They want to emphasize that they are more powerful than whoever they're, weak, whoever they're picking on. It is the alpha male persona, if you would. But yet, we as people, especially the youth, feel, okay, well, let's pull out our phone and record this incident rather than call an authority or just jump in and do something anyway. I never understood why in schools, when there was going to be a conflict, why other kids would just circle around and get ready for what was coming. Why do you think that is? Because they know what's coming. Now, the, there are going to be those kids who want to instigate the incident and will chant the fight, fight thing. And then there are other people just in around laugh and gawk. The person who often is forgotten about, the person who is often the target of the incidents are generally going to be feeling like isolated, alienated from everyone else in the world. The teachers, the teachers sometimes are responsible for bullying the students or teaching the kids how to bully. 
Where do bullies learn their acts? By the way, bullying is a learned act. It is not something that is automatically in someone's repertoire. Bullying is not something people genuinely are born to do. Bullying is a learned act that they are doing over and over again because either one, they've seen it done effectively, or two, they have done it themselves once or twice and they like the feeling. Again, the feeling is the power. The power over the person who they think they're more tougher than or the person they think they're stronger than. And for what? For for to look like you're cool in front of your mates, to look good like you're, you're cool in front of your buddies. You know, whenever I see someone who's getting bullied and getting picked on, I am often, you know, wishing that I had that ability to just, you know, teleport to the screen and do something to stop it because that's what my instincts would tell me to do because you want to know why that has been my intel to do since I've seen it what I say I have done if you if I see someone getting bullied from day one I'm going to be the one to step in regardless what happens because that's not the right that's not the easy thing to do it's the right thing to do you don't need to use rocket science to realize what is going on is wrong. And when you are standing around and clapping and applauding someone else who's being bullied, you're looking like a baboon yourself, clapping like a bunch of hyenas versus human beings who have a soul, who have reason. You are no better than a hyena. You are no better than a shark. By the way, sharks don't act generally in a pack. I mean, they do have schools of sharks. But a great white shark, when you think of it, you want to call that a bully, I guess. The great white shark doesn't walk with everybody else. And that's why the dolphins, dolphins, again, will see someone getting one of their buddies or something else being picked on by the shark. And what do the dolphins do? They don't even think twice. They jump in and they go attack the shark. A dolphin can be several times times smaller than the shark, but they know that there's four or five or six of them. There's only one shark. Now you might say, well, doesn't that make the dolphins the bullies? Well, no, because the shark would instigate the incident. And then the other dolphins step in to make sure it's ended. And you don't necessarily need to be physical to step in to something of that nature. And I'm not saying that everyone jumps one person because that would be a cowardly act too what I'm saying is there are certainly things that people can do to prevent that situation from happening to begin with for example you see this thing getting physical your first instance should be getting someone with some type of authority to end it quick because if kids are going to listen to anybody it would be someone of authority if it happens to school well there's usually several teachers around, and there should be. Granted, I want to p- point out again, bullies are not stupid as much as the dumb act. They're going to do it when there's no teachers around, so there's no witness, and they can't get in trouble. This is 101. They're not going to take the cookie from the cookie jar if you know, you're know you standing right there looking at them. They're going to wait till your back is turned, and then they'll go into the cookie jar. Same thing with the bullying aspect. The bullies are going to wait until they have the opportunity, and then they're going to do what they do, which is despicable and disgusting and ridiculous. These are things that the teachers should know and should be aware of. There should be red flags everywhere. Teachers usually will have these... And I did talk about this in the school presentation last week, how teachers have a certain responsibility, too. If they know that someone's being bullied... The old ways is keep it under your hat and don't say anything. Maybe it'll go away. Well, guess what? Those instances turn into big-time tragedies when you do that on multiple levels, some worse than others. At the end of the day, no one should ever make someone else feel like they don't not worth. No one else has a right to make you feel like you don't belong as a human being. No one has a right to make you feel poorly about yourself. No one has a right to treat you unfairly. You should be treated with kindness and respect. All honestly, the F4L way. Love, care, and compassion, understanding, respect for justice. 
and respect for each other. Differences. What you should understand is the fact that everyone's going to have a different of opinions and everyone might come from a different thing but you don't need to have conflict and I can't imagine how this thing started but I do know how it went and I was disgusted by what I saw I'm happy that my, my friend was able to stand up for himself but when the number game comes in and you have people walking around and recording versus step in and do something and cheap shots or whatever else, that's disgusting and despicable. There is no honor in doubling up on someone who's already getting bullied. You're all at fault. I felt bad for my friend. I reached out to him. I want to make sure he was okay. And I'm hoping he is. I hope that justice comes serving. I hope that I hope that there's some repercussions, and I can't wait to hear what repercussions come of this bullying incident that is on film. Not only do I think that the bully should be held responsible, the one recording the incident should be responsible. Anyone on camera of the incident should also be held in there as well. Why? Because rather than step in and do what's right and end the thing and prevent anything going wrong, any one of them could have ended any of that at any point. Reasoning or stepping in physically when you needed to. But no one thought of doing that. That's despicable, disgusting, and unmanageable. That makes me more angry probably than the person it happened to. I will not allow someone to get bullied in front of me, that's for sure. But that's common sense also. But... I'm hoping our friend, he knows who he is, is okay. I hope he knows that we are always here for him anyway. And I'm here for everybody. And listen, I want to say this again. Anyone out there who is getting bullied, anyone who out there who's feeling like you're alone, anyone who out there is feeling like you don't have that person to turn to, you don't know what to do, reach out to me and I will talk to you. You're not alone. You're not the only one. And you're not alone. You have friends, you have people who care about you, regardless if I know you or not. I will always take the time to talk to someone who's getting bullied because, you know what? There's no reason for that to happen. You are not the issue. It's not your fault you're getting bullied. It's on the bully, not you. It's on your teachers for allowing it, not you. You have to understand that bullying comes from the bully's perspective and it is their incidents, not yours. Gaslighting is a thing that goes on with these incidences all the time. Well, he did this, he did that, it's your fault. None of that. You don't have a right, no one has a right to ever put their hands on you in a way you don't want them to. No one has a right to make you feel poorly about yourself. No one has a right to downplay something or treat you unfairly based upon something that you believe in or something you do differently because they can't do it themselves whether it be jealousy or greed or anything else. So I hope that severe, strict uh, punishment is dish, dished out. I don't know what punishments they have in those areas, but I know that here you would be expelled from school. The person is responsible. But then you're going to say, well, you know, my, but my kid, you can't expel him. He only just sat there. You know what? Expel every one of them. Anyone who's seen on that camera, anyone seen in the video who's shown not to show any kind of compassion for humans, who allowed it to happen, who did nothing to stop it, they're all responsible. Bring them all in. Expel every one of them because you know what? The world doesn't need despicable, disgusting, inconsiderate baboons like you. The world should have people who are not afraid to stand up for each other, people who will show compassion for each other, respect to each other. No matter where you come from, what you do, what your hobbies are, it doesn't matter. Respect one another for your own hobbies. Stay in your lane. Someone have money, someone might not have money, who cares? But don't be a punk, don't be a bully, because you make yourself look like a fool. 
And when you think a lot of bullies use this thing, well, you know, my friends respect it or whatever. Dude, come on. That's one of the oldest, lamest excuses ever. I did it for all everybody else. Oh, I'm a funny guy. You're an idiot if you're a bully in general because you believe. Now, I want to say it. that's like a double standard. I called bullies idiots. Here's the deal. They're smart when they need to be. They're smart to know how to do things and try to get away with it, how to manipulate their way out of the, out of getting punished harder, how to hide certain things. They think they're smart. The problem is they're not. They're not as smart as others. They're not as smart as people who know what's happening. The issue is, is nobody knows how to empower the people who don't say anything, and no one knows apparently what to do in those circumstances, which is why I go to the schools and I tell them what to do in those circumstances. So I hope my friend is feeling better. Please, people, let's stop the bullying again for the 9 billionth time. Uh, because bullying is never acceptable. Bullying is never going to be accepted, nor should it ever be a thing. It is not a norm. It is not a way to live. It is a cruel and unjust act. Those who participate in bullying have no place being around the rest of society. You can send them home. Let them learn from the computer. They're not acceptable enough to be around other human beings who want to go to school or go to work or go to wherever to learn or do whatever it is they're supposed to do in that environment. You want to be an idiot? You want to be a bully? Do it in your own house. Don't be bullying other people. There's no such thing. Just don't bully anybody, anywhere, anytime. None of it's okay. Doesn't matter where it is, what it's done. Cyberbullying is a thing now. Come on, man. Leave it all. Leave the bullying aspect out of it because the world doesn't need the bullies, bullying aspects. Learn to grow from each other. Learn from your mistakes. Become better people instead of baboons or hyenas because that's what you resemble in those circumstances. So I hope that helps. I hope that shares my... my uh, feelings on the bullying aspect so thank you so for the last thing here uh, this is a really quick thing I'm not going to be on here much longer as I have done most of the things I said I was going to do for this show today <clears throat> and I will have a show later on I just want to remind people that my schedule is going to be changing, so I'm not going to have the open availability I'm going. I have currently. Um, so it's important those people who plan to come on the FOL headquarters podcast reach out to me at WOW Dream Matches D R E A M M A T C H E S at Gmail dot com. Um, I'm sorry that I missed Monster Mania over the weekend. I missed you guys all in Oak, Pennsylvania. I hope it was a good act, good weekend. Um, Rest assured, next March and all for the time, you will always have me there. Um, this is the only time I'm not going to be, and I will be there from now, from now on. Um, and that's not even going to be an issue going forward. I uh, want to say thank you to everyone who does whatever it is that they do to make the world a better place. No matter who it is, whether it be the teachers, the coaches, the, the senseis, the professors, the moms, the dads, the grandparents... Everyone out there who's making a difference actively, being a good role model, setting a good example for all of the future. Because remember, after our time's done, we're turning these, this thing over to the young people. Let's do a good job of continuing to build the real-life dream masters and the dream warriors of the world instead of uh, raising them to be hyenas or raising them to be complacent with doing nothing with their lives. I am very thankful and very blessed that I only see and I only work with and I only associate with people who have vision, who do things, who have something going on in their world, who have a motive, who have goals, and I will always take a stand against bullies. I will always do what I need to do to be a leader, not a follower. And I will always use this voice that my mother disposed upon me to make a difference in the world. So... We're going to be closing out this show. 
Uh, we have a new way of we closing out the show, and we're going to ask for a moment of silence as we close out, as we're going to remember the people who have fallen in our time before, during, or after, uh, the people we've lost along the way, to reflect upon those who we have not seen in a while, to reflect upon those we cannot say goodbye to for the last time but also to take solace in knowing that we are connected as one and that we are ending the show today and, and thinking of everyone who matters to us in the world, no matter where you are. So, Ants, take it away. Thank you, folks, and may all your dreams come true. Peace from the FYL Quarters podcast.